This program is brought to you by Emory University. Well, good evening and welcome. I'm Robert Shapiro, the Dean of Emory Law School, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this special event. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsoring firms, Alston and Bird, Kilpatrick, Townsend, and Stockton, Schiff, Harden, Sutherland, Asbill, and Brennan, Taylor, English, Duma. Their generosity contributed contributed $25,000 to advance a variety of diversity initiatives at Emory Law School, including this program and diversity scholarships for law students. I'd like to mention that the sponsorship list remains open should others like to fill in. <laughs> Special thanks also to Melba Hughes and Major Lindsay in Africa, our partners in this exciting program. Of course, I'd also like to thank our panelists and our moderator. We'll be getting fuller introductions of our panelists, but I would certainly like to acknowledge them. Uh, Tom Sager, the Senior Vice President and General Counsel of DuPont Legal. Teresa Wynn Roseborough, the Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary of the Home Depot. Rob Henriksen, Emory Law School Class of 1972, uh, the retired President and CEO of MetLife and our moderator, Terry Plummer McClure, Emory Law School class of 1988, Chief Legal Communications and Compliance Officer at UPS. I'd just like to mention that while Terry and Rob are actually alumni, uh, Tom and Teresa have been so generous uh, with their time over the years that we consider them honorary members of the Emory Law family as well. <clears throat> sure. Uh, and all of our panelists and moderator have been great leaders in promoting diversity. Now, diversity is an extremely important value for Emory University and Emory Law School. At Emory Law, we seek to advance the rule of law through the students we educate, the ideas we create, and the service we perform. And diversity is an essential component of accomplishing this mission. The inclusion of people from diverse backgrounds with diverse perspectives is a critical element of our intellectual community. It's a critical element of the learning that takes place in our classrooms, of the insight that is produced by our scholarship, of the service of value that we provide to the community. Diversity has always been a value at Emory Law School, and it always will be. US News may not value it, but we do. Now, in terms of always been a leader in promoting diversity, do you want to recognize that it was some 60 years ago that Dean Ben Johnson, Emory Law School class of 1940, and Henry Bowden, Emory Law School class of 1934, chairman of the Board of Trustees of Emory University, brought the lawsuit that allowed private colleges and universities in Georgia to become integrated. That lawsuit transformed higher education in Georgia. It transformed the legal profession. It was part of a movement that transformed society. However, diversity must be an ongoing commitment. We honor the tremendous achievements of Johnson and Bowden and others, not merely by historical reflection, though that's important too, but by ongoing actions each and every day to make our community diverse and inclusive. Johnson, Bowden, and others did not labor so hard just to produce the theoretical possibility of diversity. It must be a lived reality. And our task is to continue that tradition, to create the reality of diversity in our classrooms, in our courtrooms, in our boardrooms. That is how we honor our past accomplishments. That is how we ensure our future excellence. That is how we prepare our students to be leaders in the global environment of the 21st century. And that is why I'm so pleased and proud that Emory Law School could be a partner in putting forth this wonderful program this evening. Now, this is a wonderful event, but I would like to emphasize that this is just part of a series of events that we hope to do, part of our strategic priority of promoting diversity. Now then, to turn to our program this evening, we'd like to briefly introduce our moderator, Terry Plummer McClure, Emory Law School class 
of 1988. A native of Kansas City, Kansas, Ms. McClure received a bachelor's degree in marketing and economics before coming to Emory Law School. She began in private practice and joined the legal department at UPS in 1995. She was appointed general counsel and corporate secretary in 2006. Currently, Ms. McClure oversees UPS ethics, compliance, and legal programs in more than 220 countries around the world. She also serves on the boards of many notable organizations, including the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Leadership Council on Legal Diversity, and our favorite, the Board of Trustees of Emory University. Among her numerous awards and recognitions, Ms. McClure received the Equal Justice Works Scales of Justice Award in 2010 for supporting lawyers in public service. And in 2008, she received the Emory Law Distinguished Alumni Award. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Terry McClure. Thank you, Dean Shapiro, and uh, thank you so much for taking the time to attend this event today. We are just so astounded by the turnout, and uh, we're just so thankful that you all have been, you know, see this as a topic worthy of discussion and worthy of your time and energy. So thank you all for attending. Thank you to Melba Hughes and the uh, Major Africa, excuse me, Major Lindsay and Africa firm for sponsoring this event, as well as all of the law firm sponsors. Um, and we do appreciate your sponsorship and your support of this initiative. And again, do support uh, Dean Shapiro's thoughts that this is just the beginning of a continuing dialogue uh, about diversity and the importance of diversity and inclusion, not only in the legal community, but in the entire Atlanta community and really in all the areas in which we work and operate. So thank you for your commitment. And uh, I think you're in for an exciting evening tonight. We have an outstanding, outstanding panel. And I know you came to hear this outstanding panel. And you know, I know two of these people personally. I know personally of their commitment uh, to diversity, to the legal profession. Um, and I know them to be just really good, kind people who have benefited me, helped me out many times. And uh, I also know of one of our panelists who I've heard a great deal about, particularly about his commitment to diversity and his commitment to the Emory University uh, campus. And so I'm excited to, to meet him. And I think you all will find the discussion to be challenging and thought-provoking and hopefully lead you to raise issues in your own organizations that uh, uh, about this issue of diversity and inclusion, which unfortunately we still need to talk about. Um, so we're going to get started. I'm going to let the panelists uh, introduce themselves. I think you have some basic bio information in, in the handout. I'm going to let the panelists talk to you a little bit about their backgrounds or points that they believe are important to them. Um, most importantly, I've asked them to share uh, initial thoughts about why are they committed to this issue of diversity and uh, this discussion around the importance of diversity and inclusion and what makes them so passionate about this topic. So I'm going to start the discussion with Tom Sager. Uh, I'd like you all finished. That's a joke, <laughs> folks. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Seriously, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I think Emory has, uh, in so many other ways, has been in the forefront of uh, critically important issues to our profession. Um, by way of a little background on myself, I've actually been with the DuPont Company for 37 years. I know I look that old. Um, <laughs> we have a 212-year-old company that's tra transformed itself several times. The first lawyer that represented the DuPont Company was Alexander Hamilton. And he was retained because he could speak the language. And you're thinking, business? No, he could speak French. So uh, we have a long history uh, in representing the company. Our department itself is about 110 years old. But the issue of diversity um, took hold for us about 20 years ago at a point in time where the DuPont Company was a bit under siege. Fortunately, the activists weren't in the mix at that point in time, but we were hemorrhaging money and we needed to redefine or re-engineer how we work with our law firms at the same time the other staff functions were asked to, to do something similar by way of reducing costs, but we saw something broader by way of an opportunity here, and that was 
to select law firms that were aligned with us, not only in terms of efficiency and uh, cost delivery, but also how we would work together and how we would envision enabling uh, women and attorneys of color to represent us because we, like everybody else, was seeing the landscape changing dramatically. So at that point in time, we were a little bit ahead of the curve, and uh, at that time, it was the theme of diversity that was what was the um, overarching uh, concept. Over time, that was in the 80s and 90s, over time, as the corporation matured in its thinking, became more of a diversity and inclusion initiative because we realized that competitive advantage could come from empowering many uh, cross-sections of people within the DuPont company, gender, race, national origin, uh, sexual orientation, backgrounds, experiences, you name it. So the more we thought about this, the more the whole theme of inclusion became critically important to us because we realized that an O-line chemical company could not compete in this increasingly global space without a very energized and engaged workforce. And by the way, we're going through a renewal now, the DuPont Company, by which we will replace probably 40% of our workforce in the next five years, which is a lot of folks. And of course, a lot of our focus is upon emerging markets or developing markets outside the United States. So we kind of carried the, the, uh, the uh, the effort forward from the 80s and 90s because of our roles as lawyers and understanding the changing demographics with judges and juries and politicians. But our CEO now, Alan Coleman, realized, as I've said, to revitalize our commitment to not only diversity but inclusion to bring competitive advantage. And we've expended a lot of effort of late in doing just that. And to me, the four most compelling reasons as to why the people in this room ought to give serious thought as to why this is so important, first and foremost is the changing uh, demographics in the U.S., and you all are as aware of this as I am. Second, increased globalization, and what that means is we need to be increasingly educated and sensitive to the cultures in which we're intending to do business, and with that, collaborations, third-party uh, collaborations with the likes of competitors, NGOs, governments, suppliers, and clients that don't look or talk like I do. So to have a diverse team here in the United States as well as outside the United States is so critically important for us to succeed. And finally, to bring it even more home, we've benchmarked, that is DuPont, with close to 350 government entities and corporations around the United States, big and small. And I got to tell you, the GC suite is changing dramatically. It's becoming increasingly diverse. And that is a compelling reason for lawyers in the private sector to take note and begin to understand the changing landscape. And those GCs that are coming into place now don't have any preconceived notion as to the firms they want to use. But I do know that they want to relate to people that are from the private sector that identify with them and how they view things and how they want to pr uh, provide representation to DuPont. So, Terry, a long-winded response to you, but that kind of sums up where we are and why we are. Thanks, Terry. Good evening, everyone. And let me start by saying how grateful I am to have the opportunity to come and talk to you tonight about the value of diversity. And I'm going to speak from the perspective of our profession and the role that I think diversity needs to, to play in our um, profession. But let me just take a moment, too, to say how grateful I am to be here with, with Terry and Tom, who as general counsels have paid blaze such paths for, for all lawyers in terms of their leaders and, and their values uh, as general counsels and been great examples for me uh, only two years into the job of being general counsel with a company that's only 35 years old, so uh, still uh, with our training wheels on. But also I owe a debt to uh, Rob Hendrickson. When I first uh, left private practice to go into corporate practice, Rob was also beginning uh, his role as the president and CEO of MetLife. And met, Rob taught me not a lot about being a lawyer, but a lot about being a person and a great business leader. <laughs> I thought that's what it was. <laughs> but uh, Rob led MetLife uh, with extraordinary passion and with commitment to values that were unwavering in a lot of really difficult circumstances. And it was great for me to have that role model and to, to learn what it is to stick to your values when times are tough. And, uh, and he did that uh, superbly well. So thank you, Rob. 
Diversity has been part of my life, uh, intentionally or unintentionally, since I was very small. Uh, I started uh, grade school in a segregated grade school, uh, and then my brother and I went to an elementary school where we were the only African-American children there until we were joined by our little sister uh, five years later, uh, and then had the opportunity to go to a uh, Catholic high school where I was one of a small number of Protestant students in the uh, high school and learned a lot from that experience. Sister James Marie only sentenced me to hell twice. And then I had a chance to go to the University of Virginia on a minority presence scholarship and it was a scholarship, scholarship form fund that had been formed expressly for the purpose of attracting African American students to the University of Virginia. And for me, that was both the opportunity to go to college, the opportunity to go to a great college, and the opportunity to be part of a very enriching educational community that probably otherwise would not have been open to me. Um, coming to the University of North Carolina School of Law, um, again, I had an opportunity to be there um, on a scholarship that even though it wasn't specifically focused uh, as the EVA scholarship had been on minorities, it was still uh, very much focused on opening doors and opportunities for students to be part of that environment that otherwise would not have had the opportunity to contribute to uh, that environment. In each of those circumstances, I found enrichment from the fact that I went to school with people who came from lots of different backgrounds, who brought lots of different experiences and ideas and thoughts uh, to the table and always felt um, a part of building something better and stronger because the communities were uh, made diverse. And I've continued to find that in my professional path, you know, that it's been important in a lot of different critical circumstances that diversity both illustrate not only uh, what Dean Shapiro referenced, the core values of an organization, but also represent the opportunity to make better, stronger, more inclusive decisions uh, over time by having a diverse set of people as part of the en environment. And I have found in my own practice that the professionalism, the strength, the ability to deal with adversity, the uh, success of organizations has often been the result of their diversity than I've experienced the opposite. So I look forward to having a very open conversation with you guys tonight. I hope that everybody's willing to be a little bit frank and take things a little bit on the edge so we can have some fun with this. And uh, I invite you to ask tough questions. To Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing changes. <laughs> um, I, I am just delighted to be here. The, where Teresa uh, ended her comments is kind of where, if you wanted to know, gee, if I could have my druthers, what would this be? It would be an open dialogue uh, with everyone in the, in the room. It's kind of my style, maybe naturally, but it, uh, it has also, uh, in my mind, proved to be uh, the best way to foster inclusion by having open door, open mic uh, kind of a situation in whatever organization you're in to get people to share their ideas and so forth. Um, a little bit about my background, I, I say this, uh, you might think it's tongue in cheek, but, um, but maybe I really believe it. Uh, whether it's really true or not, I don't know, I leave you to judge, but um, if you look at a bio, if somebody was just looking at a bio, you'd say, you know, Rob, from a personal point of view, did you ever um, uh, benefit from uh, an early look at the need for diversity, no matter how narrow it might have been? And I would say, well, yes, and, and I say this with uh, uh, all seriousness. Uh, I'm from Alabama. Um, I went to the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, why did I get to go to the University of Pennsylvania? Because I was from Alabama. Um, hey, this kid's from Alabama. We'll take him. Um, and, then, and then Emory Law School, uh, at the end of uh, trying to figure out, as an English lit major, uh, what I wanted to do, um, my dad was very concerned. He sent me a letter, which was unusual. Um, you know, letters from my dad, but I recognized his handwriting right away. <laughs> and I opened it up with uh, somewhat of a, a concern, and in it it said, Rob, you know, we've talked, you know, the one, the one call a week. Most of you are too young to remember that. You know, you went to a pay phone, you found the pay phone, you put the money in, you called your parents once a week, particularly if you lived a thousand miles away. 
And uh, he said, we haven't had a chance to talk uh, about this. I don't know what your plans are, uh, but you have um, a job in Montreal, Canada, if you so desire. The worry was Vietnam. And I said, no, I, I you know, I, uh, gee, I was, it still chokes me up. But I said, you know, I, I, I just don't, I, I don't think that's what I would want to do. And he said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I, I don't know. I don't know, I'd like to teach, but I don't know if I could pursue the PhD right now. And he said to me, without any hesitation, this was on the phone when I called him back, why don't you go to law school? Law school? I said, I don't even think I have the prerequisites to go to law school. And I remember this very well. Rob, you don't need to know anything to go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he was right, meaning that meaning that no particular curriculum is required, so forth and so on. So if you want to know why I went to law school, I went because I could. <laughs> and Emory probably liked the fact that I was from the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> um, so I went to Penn because I was from Alabama, and I went to Emory because I was at Penn. Um, that's a long-winded way of saying uh, I went to law school, and um, I didn't go because I had a burning desire to be a lawyer. I went because I could. And it didn't take me long to figure out um, that something that I'm very serious about, I determined that I would never hire myself as an attorney. And if you really believe that, why would you foster that on someone else? So I knew I wasn't going to practice law. And, uh, and so I went around and interviewed almost any kind of company that could walk and talk here at Emory University. And I ended up, long story, won't go through the whole story, being an agent at MetLife here in Decatur. Um, and then I'll fast forward because 37 years, hey, I can top that one, um, a few months short of 40 years with one company. And you might say, well, that's kind of a very narrow experience. How does that relate to anything we're talking about? You know, the experience in one company. Well, the one company changed so dramatically during my 40 year stay, uh, it's almost impossible to relate it to you in any short period of time. Um, but I did find out that there were interesting facts about people essentially wanting to hire themselves all the time. I think that's, that's the main driver. It's not about, I don't want this person, it's I want myself. Um, so I went to, I was talking about this a little bit earlier, I went to a training situation, excellent, excellent, in New York, starting January 1, 1974, and a fellow came in and interrupted the meeting we were in, this guys talked to each other, they were very highly qualified technical actuaries, and then, and then the fellow left, and I said to the guy who was teaching, who was that guy? Well, his, his name is uh, Stu Nagler, but, you know, a lot of people think he's very bright, and he is, but he'll never go anywhere with the company. I said, well, why is that? And he said, this is January 1974, because he's not Irish Catholic. Now, the question is, whether that's real or not, the point is, that was what was perceived. And I left that room thinking, that's really strange. I'm near, neither, well, I'm a little bit of Irish, but I'm neither Irish nor Catholic. And I don't come from New York, so what's the future in this company? And I looked at the annual report, and literally everybody in the executive offices, seven or eight, nine people, all were Irish last names. What does that mean? Um, and so the interesting thing about feeling a lack of inclusion or a sense of inclusion can be seen from all different angles. The point that I'm making is, it's everywhere. And now that we've come so far, um, certainly the company that I worked with all those years has come so far. It's so different. There's so much to talk about, and I hope we can share with each other. But the problem with the lack of inclusion and the problem with people not seeking diversity, once you think you've done it, it's like crabgrass. It will come back. You cannot rest 
you must stay at it. And the value proposition, if you're in a major corporation, has to be a business proposition. It has to be. And you know what? That's an easy one, because it is. It's so obvious. Um, so I'd like to talk about that a little bit. But the certain elements around business case for diversity, you know, the question is, do you still use that language? Yeah, you can use it, depending on who your audience is. But it's really about certain elements. And I would say it boils down, from a business point of view, workforce, workplace, marketplace. Workforce, do you have the right people, the right time, in the right place to differentiate yourself and win in your business? The workplace, is it a place that people find exciting, that they enjoy, that makes them want to work together? Who wants to go somewhere and spend all their time where that's not possible? And then, of course, the marketplace. And then I'll, I'll just make a short comment there. With this company that I'm familiar with, the marketplace went from 100% domestic, except for Canada. The company said it was international for 130 years. It's because it was in Canada. <laughs> you know, market in Canada is smaller than the market in California. I'll give you an idea. Okay, so it's domestic. And today, about 45% of the revenues come from outside the United States. What does diversity mean in that context? What does it mean? Do you have the same kind of diversity guidelines in India or Japan today or China or Bangladesh as you have in the United States? It's a question. It's, none of this is easy, but it certainly is worth pursuing. Thank you. Now you all have talked about, um, each of you in your own way have talked about you know, the business case for diversity or the value proposition behind diversity and inclusion. I guess I'd ask, do you think that um, businesses and law firms today um, really believe it beyond just the policy stating or the principle that this is the right thing to do? Um, you know, are we still at a point where we're still convincing businesses and organizations and the people within those organizations that there is a need, there's a, a basis for talking about diversity and focusing on diversity? Or have we moved beyond that? So um, I think the per perspectives from the law, law firm and the corporate legal world are, are different, clearly. Um, I think the law firms are very short-term focused. It's about uh, the year at hand and how they did and dividing up the spoils. Um, very few law firms, I think, are very strategic in terms of their view of this issue. And it's rather sad because I think the case for um, advancing this and making it an inter integrated part of your strategic plan is so compelling to me for any number of reasons. Corporations, I think, on the other hand, get it. Um, and I'm not sitting in judgment of anybody in this room, but we understand how compelling the case may be, as you've heard from my fellow panelists. The, the, the law firms need to understand that um, it's more than um, how many clients or more work comes in the door as a result of your diversity efforts, because I think um, the case will be lost on you if you only think in, those, in that terms of that mindset. And so often, the leadership of the firm is reflective on the commitment to diversity, and with the change in leadership in a law firm, that whole commitment with respect to diversity can, can evaporate overnight. And it's so sad because you need alignment, you need a culture. Culture is critical in this regard in order to be a talent magnet. And if anybody relies upon talent, is the law firms. And unless they can convince the world at large that they are the place from which people can develop a, a career and have a, a meaningful career path and can arise to senior positions within the firm, your talent pool is going to dry up over time. And I think that's something that the law firms need to continually reflect upon and act in a way that would enable them to be more competitive in the marketplace, because I do believe it's huge competitive advantage for firms that can differentiate themselves in this regard. And I see it time and again, because I've talked to thousands of law firms over the years and 
can almost tell immediately from the engagement as to whether they are committed to this issue of diversity and inclusion and what that might mean in their ability to attract and retain and advance these professionals who will make a difference for us as they appear wherever they might appear in whatever form. Rob, you, um, as a leader of an organization, how have you been able to drive uh, the alignment around diversity and inclusion throughout your organization? How do you push that, that message down that this is something that's going on? Well, I, I, uh, I probably never said it quite this way before, but it, it's uh, top down, bottom up, and horizontal view with total transparency across your organization. So let me back up and say what that means. Um, you know, it's an amazing experience. I had an amazing experience, an amazing career experience. And, and a lot of that, if you say, I get questions, make a presentation to a business school class somewhere. And they'll, they'll ask uh, uh, questions like, um, when did you decide to be the CEO? <laughs> you know, that was at the Wharton School, by the way. <laughs> You know, you say, uh, you, and you think, is that really, did I hear that right? So you say, well, of course, you know, of course you realize that you don't decide, you know, the board of directors decides. And then the next question was, why did they decide? Uh, and to that one I said, well, it was easy in our case because I'm the oldest person in the company. <laughs> and you know what? Some people actually went like this. <laughs> so you, you have to be careful about... Uh, you know, about what you're saying and whatnot. But let's talk about what I mean by the top. Um, you know, I'm made uh, CEO of a company, and think of the first time you meet alone with your board. It's not that they haven't seen you before. It's not that they don't understand a lot that you've been doing. But this is different. You're with them for the first time. Now you're the CEO. What do you put on the agenda? What are your agenda items? You know, my agenda item, number one, today we want to t I want to talk about my succession plan for my job. Day one. Day one. Now, why is that important? It's important because it sends a message to them. More importantly, it sets a calendar for you. You've committed to something right away. Really. I mean, they looked shocked. It's the first day, and you want to, that's what you're going to talk about? Yes because I have a mandatory retirement date. Bang, here it is. Issue number two, if I'm in the job until my mandatory retirement age, which is 65, I see that we will have an opportunity to refresh the board by six members, which is half of the board. I wanna talk about that. And they say, being great, I mean, all smart, you know, accomplished people, oh, we, we, we We'll work with you on that. You know, we know a lot of people, so forth and so on. I said, well, that's great. Put them down on a list and we'll take them. And we'll all maybe look at them together. But we'll put them aside. We'll put them in a file. Because I'd like to build a model that, talks, that focuses on competencies and capabilities. I didn't use the diversity word at that point. I just said I want competencies and capabilities that we need at this company like someone who has managed someone else's money, someone who has had global responsibility for a major operation, somebody who has had systems responsibility for a major global company, people that are born outside of the United States, so forth and so on. Now I give that and then proud to tell you, we'll go through all the steps, but shorter than the time frame necessary, within three years, we had a board that had, hmm, you got any more white male CEOs? No, I, we, we have enough of that. Um, how about somebody who's managed major portfolios of other people's? Oh, that's great. You got somebody? Yeah, she happens to be Chinese. She was born in China. She's on the Asian 100. And yes, she's managed billions of dollars of money. Really good, huh? Not bad. You got a global company that's got 
that's a life insurance company, for God's sakes. Think about the health issues. Think about the, I don't want to go into all the technicalities of it, but the pricing issues, the assessment of longevity and so forth, globally. So you need somebody that's got that kind of background. How about David Satcher? Hmm, that's good. That's good, Surgeon General under two presidents, Republican and Democrat. Happens to be an African-American guy. Hmm, that's interesting. You know, what about somebody from born and, and raised and speaks Spanish as their number one language? Wow, can you do that today, going through three? And I'm happy to say that when that person retired, they replaced him with Carlos Guterres. Qualified, my point is, by going after competencies and capabilities that you need to differentiate yourself in the market, that you must have, that you cherish, and then putting certain requirements in terms of how broad that net will be, you can find exactly what you want and not have to sacrifice one iota. I think it's, I think it's amazing. Now you do that, Guess what your employee base does? Wow, look at the people on the board. Have the people on the board meet with the employees. Have, the, have them come to town hall meetings. Have them make presentations. Get them to know each other. Powerful. So, you know, you can't do it by not coming at it top to bottom, bottom up. And then the other thing, in terms of employees, uh, I have a, uh, uh, Teresa probably said, oh, he's going to talk about that again. I call it no apparent reason for failure. If you've, you see someone who happens to be an, a diverse candidate for a job, and you think this person is hardworking, intelligent, so forth, and you put them in that position, it's for you to have the responsibility that you've made the judgment that there, you can't ever be right all the time, but there's no apparent reason for failure. If there's an apparent reason for failure, the person's not ready for that job and they will fail, and then what happens? Unfortunately, disproportionately important that that diverse person failed in the eyes of still many people because it's like crabgrass. So, Coming at it that way, and then looking across the organization, and not talking so much about diversity as a separate initiative, but more, as Tom said, about attracting, retaining the best employees. And the other thing that makes it, has to be looked at too, if you're sitting down at a figurative table, your organization, and you're looking across the table, and you don't look like your clients, you're dead. Dead. Nobody ever disagreed with me, at least <laughs> to my face. <laughs> but there was a lot of dialogue about it. Uh, the only other thing I would say, we had groups, uh, you know, uh, around the company, set them up, uh, facilitated them. And I thought, after some time went by, we could streamline that a little bit and have it be part of uh, a broader HR initiative. Employees told me, you're not as committed as we thought you were. It didn't matter whether I was committed or not. The fact they perceived that that was a problem, we corrected it. Follow back up on that. There's two points I want to, I'm gonna come back to the point you made about no apparent reason for failure and investing in their success. But I want to talk about when you don't approach it as a, just a common competency initiative and it becomes a diversity initiative for recruitment or for placement of people. You, you often run into the sort of two dynamics. On one side you have the white backlash. In order to advance a, a person of diverse background then someone has to lose out. And there's that perception. I'd like maybe Rob and Tom, you all to talk about that. But Teresa, I'll start with you. And talk about it from the perspective of someone who may be perceived as having benefited from a diversity program. And uh, how do you overcome the perception that you may be in your role for reasons other than your competency? Uh, sure. 
Easy question. <laughs> you know what, Teresa and I don't talk about at lunch when we have... <laughs> exactly. You know, um, Dean Shapiro actually said something pretty provocative in his opening remarks when he talked about diversity as a value and as reflective of the values and morality of, a, of, a, of an entity, of an organization, or of a company. And there's certainly a context in which that's true, that as we think about diversity as a bomb and an insurance policy, if you will, against discrimination as a badge that reflects immediately and in a very visible way inclusiveness and the lack of exclusion for immutable characteristics, as we think about uh, diversity as perhaps protecting against uh, unfortunate or bad, some of the more anecdotal bad decisions you've heard about entities making that only if the, a more diverse group of people had made that decision, maybe they wouldn't have called the product that horrible name. So, so there, in that context, uh, diversity does serve a value principle. Uh, but it also serves a more fundamental uh, principle of corporate America, at least, which is that it helps us make money. And I say that not to be tongue in cheek, but going back to the language of a, of a business case uh, for the Home Depot, for MetLife, or any other company, and the service of a shareholder uh, is rarely about uh, ad adherence to uh, a moral code unless you can translate that moral code into the value of enriching the gains of that investor the values associated with enriching the gains and the experiences of the associates that work for you, and the value of enriching the quality of what you serve and what you sell to the American public. And the question becomes, do you do that better? Do you do that more successfully? Do you do that with more credibility and value if you do it with a diverse set of people than with a non-diverse set of people? And I think that the answer proven over and over and over again is clearly, Yes, that just like there's a value to selling the best power drills in America, which we do at the Home Depot, <laughs> there's a value to designing and selling and merchandising and pricing that product with the most diverse team of people you can possibly bring to bear of the, on the problem so you can get the best possible decisions made about that. And so you can very quickly give people confidence that the right skill set has been brought to bear in creating that, that product. I worked for a very smart man, Frank Blight, and uh, perhaps one of the, uh, the most, uh, certainly the most successful uh, retailer CEO in the country um, today. And I think he would tell you as he embarked on his general counsel search that he wasn't looking for a particular person. He wasn't looking for a particular gender. He wasn't looking for a particular race. But he was looking for someone that would contribute to his existing team. Uh, in addition to bringing strong legal skills and an ability to represent the company, to reflect the values of the company, he also felt that the leadership of the Home Depot needed to reflect the diversity of the associates that work there, the diversity of the customers that serve, the diversity of the environments in which it hopes to operate. And so I am positive that he cast a broad net and that the fact that I brought additional diversity to his leadership team was not a fact that he ignored in the process. And I would say that that's been true my whole life, that uh, the opportunity to bring diversity to different environments has been something that has be benefited me personally, to be sure. It certainly benefited me when I came to the University of, of, of Virginia on a Minority President Scholarship. But I hope that the contributions have been mutual. I hope I have brought to those environments as much or more than I have taken away from them uh, and, and left some enrichment on the table uh, beside me. And I think once you are in a position, uh, oftentimes, whether you, no matter what your diversity status is relative to the rest of the organization, you have to establish your abilities and your capabilities and your competencies in connection with that job or position. 
You also have to be dedicated to doing it the way you think it should be done and, and bringing your own values to the table and not trying to emulate or overly imitate the people behind you uh, or whom you followed. If you can do that and stay steady to a core, then I think you will um, rebuff any criticism about your ability to do the job based on some immutable characteristics. So I don't mind that I get picked or, or asked to do things because I'm an African-American woman. I don't mind that people decide that I could bring something to the table day one because I come to that table as an African-American woman. I think hopefully I'll have the opportunity to validate that they're right when I get there, but that's the obligation that I take on. But I think to shrink from the fact that someone might have gotten a seat at the table because they could swing a tennis racket you know, Jester Drink was for a long time chose law clerks not only that were smart, brilliant, good people, and successful enough, but also they had to have tennis game. <laughs> I don't think that they felt that they were um, harmed or they had something to prove to the other clerks because they had a tennis game. They had something to prove to Justice Rinkless because they had to serve the ball back, but that's not what they thought that their obligation was to prove that they deserved the job once they got there. Uh, and that's the way I have approached the various opportunities that I've had as an African-American woman. And at the same time, um, you can't uh, fail to acknowledge for all of us that you make a choice to go through one door then, and other doors may or may not be open to you or you made a choice that's going to close those doors for you. And that's true in all of our, our lives. But I would encourage people, don't feel self-conscious about choosing paths that are followed or have been walked by people who look different from you, who come from different backgrounds from you, who don't have the same uh, experiences as you do, except that as you go down that path, you will bring something to it that will be more enriching to the people around you. Um, Rob, what, uh, what do you say to the individual that thinks that uh, their opportunities are limited uh, because of this focus on diversity? <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it, it can be um, seen as it, it can be seen as a difficult problem if you don't uh, have open dialogue and, uh, and address it and get people to work together. I mean, um, you know, if people understand one another and see the value, um, at least my experience has been that um, you know white toast guy who's been around a long time, who whatever, whatever. You know, people are not stupid. People understand whether or not they have enough gas in their tank, whether or not uh, they have the intellectual capacity, whether or not they have the energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if they are around and communicate with and are on teams with people that knock their socks off, most people working for a large corporation, most people, certainly the people that, that I would want to retain and keep and had, the, had the, uh, a pretty good track record on that, they want the organization to win. They want the team of people that they're associated to, to win. If you have a team of people together and they see and appreciate each other's strengths and something different they bring to the table, um, they're, they're appreciative to have them, let me put it that way. Um, and so there's, there's, always, there's always the question when somebody comes in and says, well, what about me? You know, I've been working here for 30 years, I've been doing this, that, and the other. Well, uh, review their track record with them. Talk to them about what they're doing, what they're not doing. Talk to them. Um, I had a, the, the best performance management review I've ever had in my life was pretty late uh, in the scheme of, of this long career. And it was um, my boss calling me in, and we're gonna have a performance management review. And he looks at me and says, Rob, we don't have time to talk about what you do well. Now think about that one for a minute. <laughs> You can take that almost any way you want to. Does that mean I do so much well that we just would run out of time? The other punchline was because we're expecting so much more out of you. What you do well has become a requirement. 
that's, that's table stakes. We're expecting so much more of you. And most people that take the position, you know, I've been around, I'm being discriminated against because, you know, these new bright people are coming. Yeah, guess what? They haven't had that kind of discussion. It's unfortunate for them because if they really understand, you know, what's required and they have the ability to be on the team that's going to win, guess what? That's okay if they understand. If they don't, they just go away and they're just mad. And they tell their next door neighbor and they tell their wife or their, their spouse, whoever, you know, I got mistreated. I, I don't see it as that big a problem as long as you're open, open communications, open door, and give people the mic in town hall meetings. I learned so much in town hall meetings, I can't even tell you. And when you really hit the home run is when somebody grabs the mic and say, look, look, <laughs> look, buddy. <laughs> you just said something, and you might think that that, you, that, that has a certain meaning, but I, it has a different meaning to you, to me, than it does for you. You know what that's like in a meeting with three, 400 people? When you have to answer it, you can't say, well, see me after doesn't work. Um, so the, it, it's, it's, it's keeping those doors and that communication open and I think people understand their own strengths and weaknesses, much more than you would give them credit for. Barry, hey. I used to have a difficulty having these conversations with just those white males you're thinking about, but over time I thought about there are two really aspects to being an effective lawyer. One as a practitioner, but also as a leader. And are you, are you the type of person that is willing to invest in the organization as a whole and individuals and give unselfishly? And that's a very bright line for many. So the lawyer is a given for me when you're talking about the senior leadership. It's the leader I'm looking for. And it's not a hard conversation to have with certain people because they've defined their success by their expertise or competency, not necessarily their influence within the organization itself. And if you think about that, I think it will serve your organization, and certainly it's served ours very well. And over time, people understand that. And, and as you lead by example in promoting those people that have evidenced both sides of that equation, leader plus lawyer, I think you're going to find that task easier as you attempt to uh, strengthen your organization and, and elevate the people that really deserve to be promoted because of their investment in the entire organization. Okay, so the bad news is we're almost out of time, and I haven't gone through half my questions yet. Um, but I have one more question, and then we are going to open it up to the audience, and we'll have some mics that will be at each side of the room. We'll ask you to use the mics if you do have questions, because we are videotaping this series. Um, but my last question, Tom, I'll, I'll start it off with you, and anyone can jump in. I think lately the, the, the terminology around diversity has, has been, um, the discussion around diversity and, and inclusion has really focused on the broader global diversity. And I think that there's been some debate about whether or not a, an emphasis on global diversity um, has the uh, impact of uh, demean, I guess, minimizing the focus um, from a US perspective on traditional forms of diversity. And so those diverse candidates or, or, or individuals feel like the company or the organization, by focusing on a global perspective, is just doing that really so they don't have to focus on the U.S.-related issue. Um, any thoughts on that or that perspective, or have you seen that in, in your experience? I quite honestly don't see the focus on globalization causing a less than intense focus upon the importance of diversity within the United States. Of course, each country is unique, and as you define diversity here, it will be radically different as to how one views it outside the U.S. And it becomes more of a gender issue in parts of the world and less about race and, uh, and other considerations. So, no, I don't see it. Recognize that we have the finest judicial system and intellectual property system in the world, and that drives a lot of uh, the value and, and uh, why this country is so great and so and increasingly diverse, but I think the importance of diversity here will keep us in the forefront in the years ahead, and that's why we can't take, take our eye off the ball, because we have to lead by example here, and it'll, I think, come naturally to us outside the United States if we're truly principle-based and one focused upon 
the things that Rob and, and Teresa have talked about tonight. I think, Terry, you raise a very good issue, and I think that it's sometimes easier to articulate and think about the global issues and issues of language and, and very strikingly different cultures, and particularly talking about people who come to this um, country in circumstances that don't reflect a history of discrimination, that we still have a very difficult time figuring out how to talk about uh, with each other. And I think sometimes when we talk about you know, think globally, act globally, it's to try to elevate the conversation at a level that gets beyond the, the facts and circumstances of our American upbringing. But I think that it's very critical that we continue to think about not just global diversity and language and cultural diversities, which are all also very important, but also uh, the history of uh, diversity that is brought by bringing the minorities in this country uh, and who come from African-American heritage, Hispanic-American heritage, Indian-American heritage, uh, into the broader um, society and the value of that kind of diversity brings to our organizations and not escape from the conversation about that kind of diversity uh, or gender-based diversity by going to elevating the conversation or more global sphere. Um, can I bring up the example here? Yeah, sure. Um, I, uh, I struggled with uh, uh, Terry and my colleagues a little bit about I was going to bring up something that I think should be troubling to us as, as lawyers here in Georgia and as members of the uh, Georgia Bar and prospective members of the Georgia Bar. And there's an article uh, in the Fulton County Daily Report from last Tuesday that talked about uh, the formation of a committee by the Bar to select the next executive director of the Georgia Bar. And many of you know Cliff Brazier uh, died last year. Uh, Cliff Brazier was a 21-year director of the bar and one of the most uh, distinguished uh, professional people you would ever want to meet in your life. And in many, many ways, the bar owes its present uh, success across a, lots of different uh, horizons to the work of Cliff Brazier. So it was a, uh, a painful and, and raw room, and I wasn't in the room, but I can only imagine how painful and raw it was for the lawyers in the room uh, at the mid-year meeting of the bar to talk about the process of selecting a successor for, for Cliff. Uh, and the committee ultimately that was appointed by our, our uh, bar ref president, who's an excellent person, uh, consists of 12 people, uh, nine of whom are white men, three women, and one African-American. All 12 of them are pillars of our bar. All 12 of them are people whose careers reflect dedication not only to their own practices, but to our profession and to the communities that are served in their profession. Uh, they are our best and our brightest, to be sure. But as a group, they also do not reflect all that the Georgia Bar presently is. And as a group, they don't reflect all that the bar will be and has the opportunity to be. And for me, it raises the concern that when they select a new executive director, and I'm sure they will select an excellent person, but that that person starts out with something to prove. They start out with having to prove that a more diverse selection committee still would have selected them. They start out having to prove that they were selected by someone who had in mind the many different cultures, environments of the communities, of the lawyers, of the clients uh, that we serve across the state of Georgia. And I think that as leaders of the political community of the state, as leaders of the service community of our state, that we should be concerned about our bar always acting in a way that's reflective of the culture that's building within the bar, that's building within our state, and making sure that we don't do things that inadvertently suggest a backward step when what we're trying to do is make step forwards. Um, and I think that we should think about how we, as a professional organization, make sure that our leaders, that our participants, our members, care more deeply about the issues that our clients clearly do 
care about, and that we make sure that those values, that those concerns are reflected in the activities and conduct of the leaders of our bar. All in agreement, say aye. Aye. <laughs> and I think that really brings us full circle, you know, back to where we started. You know, are we, we, con we continually need to have this dialogue and keep this issue in front of us because we can become insensitive to our own actions if we're not intentionally focusing on these issues. So with that, I'll, I'll open the floor up for questions. I have a few if you all are too shy or too tired. But uh... My question is, um, <clears throat> how do you evaluate our progress towards increasing diversity in the legal profession over the last year, five years, and 10 years? And what do you see as the major uh, impediments towards continued progress and how can we work our way around some of those major impediments to continuing progress? Bless you two in the future, uh, announce yourself. But that's Charles Morgan, one of the early proponents of uh, diversity in our, in our community here in Atlanta. I knew you'd throw one out there, Charles. <laughs> uh, incremental progress at best. And uh, for the faint of heart, this isn't where you want to be. It, I keep on reminding myself it pays to persevere, so I take a lot of, of uh, energy and, and uh, comfort in those anecdotes that I hear, and the trick to me is tell the stories, those success stories of where an energized, diverse team have delivered a tremendous value to your corporation or to your law firm. Um, if you get hung up on the numbers, you're going to get... Um, distracted improperly and perhaps even depressed, I, I, I can see the progress being made. Uh, I can see the landscape changing. As I mentioned, the GC suite is one, and perhaps uh, there are other indications. But um, as I said, uh, to overcome, you've got to convince the law firms, because they are really where we find our talent within the corporations, that this is in their long-term interest, and that's not an easy uh, task, as I said before, because in so many cases, they're so short-term focused. How much do we divide up during the course of the uh, balance of the year? So it's one of those things that those strategic thinkers in the legal community that understand the importance of this and how it'll position their firms and change their models with respect to career development, compensation, origination fees, and all of that stuff just needs to have to be revisited and reworked. And I think they're going to be more happy and more successful at the end of the day. And they'll find clients like DuPont and Home Depot and others that'll uh, side, uh, line up with them uh, based upon those step changes in behavior that they're going through. Another question? Hi, Amy Loggins. I have a question for you. Um, Mr. Sager, you said that you believe that corporations and law firms are not necessarily aligned in their viewpoints of diversity. You also said that your company does a lot of tracking of the diversity and inclusion that your firms or vendors provide. Um, how, and we, I think we would all agree that diversity is bigger than just race and gender, and that optics are very important. But how do you ensure that your vendors, including your law firms, are truly embracing diversity and inclusion, and how do you track that? They are required to provide us a critical self-assessment every year, which is, gets down to a very granular level with respect to hours worked, teams, identification by race, gender, sexual orientation, all of that with an eye to hopefully we see step changes in behavior and progress, not every year, but that's the sort of, that's where the dialogue begins and where the accountability starts. So if you don't relentlessly ask for this feedback and the assessments back, then they are not going to take you seriously. Powers in the purse. If you're not seeing those step changes in behavior, then you start assigning within our network to different law firms and maybe even go outside. And we certainly have done that. But again, we're investing in these firms with a purpose because we think they're committed to the same core values that we are. So those conversations occur on a regular basis, an annual basis. And try to identify those firms that are doing it better than others and lift it up and share it among them. 
and then recognize them through any number of, of ways, through awards and, and the like. I'm not sure it's the perfect solution or the perfect approach, but it's one that we're comfortable with. I would just say we do have miles to go before we sleep, and a lot of uh, the progress that been been made has been, you know, progress, long plateau, progress, long plateau, and not the steady upward climb that you might hope. Um, I would say there are a lot of um, norms out there that we accept that we can start to break down a little bit. In reality, most lawyers in America don't practice in large law firms. Most of them practice in small to medium law firms. And, but a lot of the political and economic wealth is focused on and concentrated within those large law firms. Um, so getting those law firms to be better examples, to do diversity better, to be more attuned to it and more consistent in their messaging around it and in their demonstrations around it is, is very important. But it's also important for uh, companies like MedLife, Home Depot, DuPont, to be more part of the story of spreading work around to other firms who are, that are not part of sort of the large firm uh, network and taking advantage of the, the talent and value of smaller uh, law firms. And I think we're increasingly doing that. I think the law firm model is changing uh, the country so that we continue to march in the right direction. But all of the things that we've been doing, we have to keep doing and do even more aggressively. We have to keep encouraging people to choose the law as a profession. We have to keep mentoring people who are in law school to succeed in law school and to uh, approach with passion and energy and commitment the practice of law and to um, be willing to work thousands and thousands of a year, hours a year to make the Home Depot happy. So we have to keep uh, the pedal to the metal of our, um, of our efforts. And the, the crabgrass comment that, that Terry made earlier, or that Rob made, it's, it's true. You have to keep at it. It's not something that we can stop doing so we can continue to feel the benefits of the progress that we're making. I'd say you have to keep at it, um, and anything that's worth doing is worth measuring. I think the, the, the comment goes, the, the trap that, you, that we all need to be um, cognizant of and wary of because we have to keep at it all of the time is that certain uh, measures and metrics can end up being 100% of your decision-making process, and that's very dangerous. Uh, because you have to be able to interpret what your data is telling you. You have to be, really understand what it is telling you, and then, of course, what you're going to do about that. Um, and so we all know um, there are all kinds of ways to measure things uh, simply by raw numbers here and there. And, and uh, unfortunately, um, people are pretty good at manipulating numbers. Um, but, and they may not tell you what they think, wh what you think they tell you, and it may not give you a path to know what to do about it other than to look at the same number every year and go over it, and that's just not the answer. It can't be. We have one more question here. A couple more questions. Given the uh, increasing mo mobility of the most successful partners in law firms and their demonstrated willingness to move, how do you instill this longer-term view uh, in the leadership of that they might move to another firm the next year or the next month? So I'm, I'm torn on the question because I realize firms need to create critical mass, and they get that through lateral transfers and by uh, uh, attracting uh, established, diverse practitioners. So I, I get that, but we're we're just passing on the same valuable assets without growing the diverse base of the profession. So I'm kind of torn by the question. I don't know the answer. I do know that um, certain firms that evidence that commitment are more intent on laterals and how they can build out their, their, um, their firm in a way that is more welcoming and, and it will attract the younger people along the way. So I can't question that that strategy, but I'm, I'm wondering out loud, is it really enhancing the profession at large? That uh, just real quickly, I think one of the things that um, 
that corporations have gotten a little better than law firms. I think it's getting better now, but corporations certainly know that you don't want to lose the investment once you hire someone and, and spend the money to bring them on board and on board and train them. You, you have a, a vested interest in keeping that person there, and I think that goes back to the comment that was made about ensuring that there's no apparent reason for their, their lack of success, that you have to invest in their future and invest in their success. I think corporations understand that principle and do a pretty good job of it because it's just too costly to have turnover. And I think law firms have to understand that principle as well. But I think that goes to the whole model of the law firm and is there an incentive within the organization to invest in the younger talent and keep them there and provide them the work that will allow them to grow their business. And I think that the law firms continue to struggle with how to do that. I agree too, but I also want to say that we have to continue to build entrepreneurial spirit within um, minority law firms and help them succeed as entrepreneurs so that they can continue to contribute to the diversity of the bar as well. Good evening. I'm Veronica Higgs Cope. I am a solo practitioner here in Atlanta and also the current president of the Georgia Association for Women Lawyers Foundation. Um, I first want to thank the panel and Emory Law School for putting on this uh, presentation today. I would say that I would love to have heard from uh, some of the law firms, being that we are here in Atlanta, uh, we are here in Georgia, I would have loved to have heard their perspective on uh, diversity and inclusion and their commitment to the same. My question is, do you as a panel think that it's easier for corporations to um, include and address the issue of diversity and inclusion than for the law firms? Let me take a crack at that because I'm not really sure um, what the answer would be if, you, if, I, if I give you a, a, uh, some comments and then you said, and, and you weren't a lawyer, and you said, well, how does it work in a law firm? I can't really tell you. Um, what I can tell you is that um, the, I came from a company that at one point uh, when somebody talked about human resource human resources, uh, who came in from outside the company to talk about things that needed to be done in human resources. I realized for the first time that I was working somewhere that was back in a time warp that was really about personnel departments. I mean, as strange as that sounds. Now, I, you know, I'm old enough that I can remember some of this stuff. A per, you know, there was no focused human resource management. Uh, there was no uh, uh, requirement that someone was responsible for someone's future and their development. Um, now, my perception is, is that law firms um, are busy doing a lot of stuff, but I don't know what their HR departments are all about. I don't know what their performance management is all about. Um, I know that in the corporate setting, once you set that, that timetable down, you don't have any choice. You don't have a choice as to whether or not you're going to have a performance management review with people who work for you, if it's done right. Uh, they can't say, uh, I don't know what my boss thinks about me. I don't know how well I'm doing after six months in a 12-month year. That's not allowed because the calendar doesn't allow that to happen. I don't know what happens in, in law firms. Um, my perception is that maybe not so much. Maybe not so much. And I'm not sure the, the uh, and I don't want to get into stuff that I really don't understand, but the whole thing about, about a, a process of billable hours, maybe that's gone the wayside, I don't know. But what a, I mean, how do you possibly manage people around, around that sort of compensation program? I don't get it. And so you could have really bad actors when it comes to dealing with people and developing people being the highest paid, most successful people in the firm. That's not going to happen, not in the corporation that, you know, that I'm familiar with, nor any of my clients. I think you raise a good point, and I think that Dean Shapiro has another topic for the next series on uh, diversity. <laughs> we'll 
have some uh, managing partners up here. I would say, quite honestly, the landscape has changed dramatically. The ability of corporations such as DuPont, who don't pay as much as private law firms or certainly pharmaceutical companies, no offense to anybody out there, but um, the work-life balance, the core values, the inclusive uh, powering environment, I don't necessarily believe that it exists in law firms broadly. It's a very um, eat what you kill. It's division by associate, paralegal, senior partner, rainmaker. So I, I, I think it's a dramatically different environment for the most part. Now, there are exceptions out there, but our ability to attract and, and uh, talented minorities and women now is at an all-time high because they want something different. They want quality of life. They want to be more into the strategic side of the practice of law as opposed to the tactical. They may be getting tired of the just depositions and those travel all over the country. So there's a whole different dynamic occurring now that I think makes in the in-house practice far more appealing in so many ways than the law firm. And you can hoot me down, but I believe that's the case, and I can see it firsthand. Our last question, I'm sorry. I'm trying to make it decent. Um, my name is Peg Young. My question really relates to communication. Um, Rob, I'm sorry, I'm not doing very well with the microphone. Rob made a good point earlier about how we tend to hire people that we like, and uh, we have to make a concerted effort to, to not hire people just like us, or uh, not people that we like, but people that are just like us. I've seen um, that in communication, that in at least in corporate life that we tend to relate to people that communicate like us and at times uh, perhaps um, you know, push back at people that don't communicate like us and there tends to become a dominant approved communication style in corporations. And, you know, it, it's not a secret that it, for a long time it's starting to change that in corporations the dominant leadership was largely white male. What can we do to encourage diversity um, and acceptance in communications because I think there's a huge business advantage there uh, that we are really missing the boat on. But I think just like with, with other characteristics, when you're trying to de define success, you tend to start with the characteristics and qualities that made you successful, replicate them as best you can and the next person to come and then you try to attract for that. And I think that you accidentally are naturally attractive to work for and with of people who see in you the qualities that they see in themselves and the attributes that they see in, in themselves. Uh, and part of what a good diversity of a, initiative can do is to help us see ourselves for our attractiveness to others like us and see our attraction to others like us and give us an opportunity to inspect that a little bit and make sure that it doesn't overwhelm our decision-making uh, process. Uh, when you talk about different communication styles, it's not just communications, it's all different types of styles of interacting with people and with our environment and finding a way to grow a broader range of, of tolerance for what makes someone successful. Uh, and if you look at uh, the broad swath of people who are successful in this country and look at the broad swath of people who are successful, well, successful in our profession, they all do something a little bit differently and approach the work and their engagement with others uh, a little bit differently. And we have to grow our tolerance and appreciation that things that are different from us aren't necessarily unsuccessful. They're just successful in a different way. Well, with that, I'm sorry to have to cut off the discussion, and I hope well, this will be the beginning of, of what is an ongoing discussion. Um, but I do want to thank the panel, particularly Tom. I want to thank you not just for your presence here today, but your you know, years of leadership in this field. Um, Tom has been uh, such a tremendous challenger for the in-house bar uh, in terms of challenging us in terms of how we operate, how we interact with our law firms, and how we um, look to advance this case of diversity. And um, I just want to thank you for your leadership. Teresa, thank you also for your voice, your authentic voice on these issues and your willingness to, to speak on behalf of so many. And um, look forward to your continued leadership and picking up the, 
the bar from Tom and continuing to pass it on. And Bob, Robert, thank you for your leadership, he, not in the legal field directly, but certainly your love of the law and your commitment to Emory University, and uh, particularly on the, the grounds of diversity. And I just want to recognize you for the scholarship fund that you put forth on behalf of minority students who are seeking a legal career. I think that last year the, the fund was at $2.5 million, and it was the largest individual gift in the law school's history. So, So for someone who didn't want to be a lawyer. You see how guilty I feel about taking that spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you've given back many fold, so we thank you for that. And with that, I'll turn the podium over to Melba Hughes for our closing comments. Hi, I know many of you. My name is Melba Hughes. I'm a partner with Major Lindsay in Africa, a legal search firm here in Atlanta and actually throughout the world. We're global too. <laughs> Before going forward, I, I want to share some personal notes with you. I promise I threw away my 10 page speech, so I will limit this to just a few minutes if you'll just humor me and, and listen for a moment. When my partner, Catherine Butts, and I went to see the dean about a year ago to talk about doing the speaker series, we felt very fortunate that he didn't throw us out of his office. We would not be here tonight with this esteemed group of people and with such energy in this room, but for the vision of our dean. So please help me to thank him. And then when I went to Terry, who I still call Terry Plummer, and said, Terry, you've got to help me with this. She too didn't throw me out of her office. Instead, she embraced the concept. To put something on like this tonight required a lot of energy on, on the parts of a lot of people. Um, Joella, who many of you know, who's attached to the law school, my good friend Gardner Corson over there, who getting on Tom Sager's schedule is the hardest thing I've ever done. Believe me, I've gotten through some doors in the past. But Tom, thank you so much for, for making the time. We, we really appreciate that. And everybody on this panel, um, believe it, they have given of their time. It takes a lot of prep work. Now, one would think that Terry could get everybody together on one call to prep. No, instead, she did three calls. <laughs> so thank you again. I also want to thank you for participating. You can plan all you want. And as I said to Professor Brown earlier, you plan a party and you hope people come. Thank you for participating in this party. We hope you've been energized by the conversation, by the stories. It, we are a community. This is a public conversation. We would love for you to continue the conversation outside of these walls. With that said, I'd like to invite the dean up because we would like to present a small token of our appreciation to our panelists. Thank you so much.